Village Wooing, a play about reading and writing, presented by Jean Reynolds. Welcome to beautiful Wiltshire Downs, one of the settings for Village Wooing. Before we turn to Shaw's play, I have two questions for you to think about. Much of this talk is going to be about imagination. My first question is about reading. Imagine that you've just read a wonderful book. The author is someone you'd really like to know. You unexpectedly have a chance to meet that author. How would that work out? How closely does the writer in our head match the actual person? I have another question that tests your knowledge of Shaw. Imagine you're on a quiz show. For $50,000, can you name two Shaw plays with all of these features? A bet that involves a language challenge. A young woman who took an elocution course to qualify for a job. A man who earns his living through language. A married couple who run a shop. A marriage across class lines. There's no definite answer to the first question. Even though the book was magical, the writer might not be likable at all. The answers to the second question are Pygmalion, of course, and a 1933 play that some lovers of Shaw may not know much about, Village Wooing. I've seen Village Wooing only once, as a lunchtime play at the Shaw Festival. I enjoyed it, but didn't think much about it. It's very short. There are only two characters and two settings, a ship and a shop. Shaw himself called it a very trivial comedietta. But then fate took over. Bob Gaines asked me to write a chapter for his Marriages and Misalliances book. My assignment was three plays, On the Rocks, The Simpleton of the Enchanted Isles, and Village Wooing. Village Wooing turned out to be the play that wouldn't leave me alone, and I set out to find out why. Here's an outline of the play. There's a shipboard meeting that doesn't go well. A few months later, the man and woman meet again at the shop where she works. A few months later, they decide to get married. That's the whole play. Shaw never gave names to the two characters. A is older and a widower. He makes his living writing the Marco Polo series of chatty travel books. Z is younger, single, and female. She's a shop assistant in a small village. She won a contest and used the prize money to pay for a cruise. She likes to read. Instead of acts, there are three conversations. In conversation one, they meet for the first time on the deck of the ship. She keeps talking, talking, and talking. He's trying to meet his 500-word morning writing goal. Finally, she leaves him alone and goes off to eat lunch. Six months later, A wanders into the shop where Z is working. She impresses him with her business knowledge. She remembers him and confesses that she knew who he was when they met on the ship. She had made a bet with the other passengers that she could get him to talk to her. He's tired of writing and decides to buy the shop. He keeps her on as his assistant. He doesn't want to marry her. The third conversation comes some time later. She's been pushing him to marry her. Finally, he agrees. That's the whole play. And now I have a confession to make. I've told you three lies about village wooing. First, there are four characters, not just two. We'll have more to say about the two imaginary characters soon. Second, the outline I showed you is wrong. Here's the correct outline. 
Only the parts in blue were written by Shaw. There's an imaginary prequel when A is writing his travel books and Z is reading them and dreaming about the oh-so-romantic Marco Polo man. And there's another complication. The first conversation goes through two versions. The first was written by Shaw, and we see it on stage. The revision happens only in our heads. We'll talk more about those missing parts later. The third lie is that Village Wooing was written by Bernard Shaw. That's only partly true. Village Wooing is a collaboration between Shaw and the audience. You and I write the prequel and revise the first conversation. At the same time, we're tracking what's happening on stage. Stanton B. Garner tells us that playgoers turn into playwrights whenever we watch a play. We're always guessing about what's happening on stage. As the play unfolds, we revise those guesses. Comprehension of events in the theater is always provisional and, until the end of performance, necessarily incomplete. In its temporal unfolding, dramatic plot is a string of inferences, the moment's best guess. Every Shavian knows that Shaw wanted a pit of philosophers, but we may not realize that he also wanted a pit of playwrights. And that brings us back to something I mentioned earlier. The similarities between Pygmalion and Village Wooing. Could Shaw have been thinking about writing a second play about language? A play about reading and writing? Perhaps. But there's a problem. Reading isn't interesting on stage. It's too solitary. Writing has the same problem. There's nothing to see except a pen moving on paper or fingers tapping on a keyboard. Here's how I think Shaw solved that problem. He added those two imaginary characters we talked about. The reader in A's head and the writer in Z's head. Those two imaginary characters have known each other for a long time. Now the sparks can fly. A provocative article by Walter Ong, a Jesuit, might be helpful here. The Writer's Audience is Always a Fiction was published in the 1975 PMLA. Ong says that a reader has to play the role in which the author has cast him, which seldom coincides with his role in the rest of actual life. The popular radio show, A Prairie Home Companion, was a great example of inviting audiences to act. When you tuned in, you felt like a member of a Lutheran church in Minnesota. Shaw, a bit of an actor on paper, knew all about involving audiences this way. When we read Shaw, we become blazing supporters for his ideas or lively members of his social circle, or close friends who share his deepest thoughts, or some other role. He knew how to engage us in an endless variety of ways. For years, I've spent huge amounts of time reading Shaw. I've always told myself that it's because he's such an interesting and pleasant companion. Gradually, though, I've come to realize there's another reason. I like the person I turn into when I read Shaw. I'm funnier and smarter than I am in real life. If we follow Shaw and Ong's lead, Village Wooing explores two kinds of role playing. We already know that actors role play on stage. We may not notice how often we role play while we're reading and writing. Now let's look at village wooing. A is a snob who thinks the middle class is beneath his notice. The buyers for his books are dreaming shop girls, hungry for exotic places and romance. 
So what if he's only pretending to be a chatty and charming travel guide? What really matters are his royalty checks. Z is young, smart, and single. She has read all the Marco Polo chatty travel guides. She wants to walk among the ruins in the moonlight with the Marco Polo man. She thinks A is that man. And that's our prequel, the relationship that began when A started writing and Z started reading his travel books. The challenge for both of them is to sort out what's real and what isn't. Is A a romantic world traveler or a hard-working writer who just wants to fill his quota every day? Is Z a dreaming shop girl or a smart businesswoman? She's the first to sort out what is and isn't real. She learns that those faraway places are hot, smelly, and full of insects. She gives up her chatty act. She's discovered that A isn't really the chatty Marco Polo man, but she still wants him. A, the travel writer, has his own issues to sort out. He wants to marry a woman from his own class, but he doesn't like their wasteful spending habits. He's always scorned shopkeepers, but now he's finding that he enjoys the shop and his customers. Here's our outline again. You can see the prequel where A and Z first met within the covers of his books. And you can see where we revised the first shipboard meeting. Z fooled A and us. She was putting on an act for the benefit of the Marco Polo man. We revise our notion of what happened at that meeting. I have three takeaways for you. First, I hope you're curious about Walter Ong's article. I've posted it online. We all know that Shaw often started acting as soon as he picked up a pen. What we may not notice is that we often start acting too. It's an idea that's worth exploring. Second, I encourage you to start thinking of yourself as a playwright who's collaborating with Shaw or Pinter, or Shakespeare, or Hansberry, or another writer. Try diagramming a play. What parts of the story did you supply yourself? It's fun, and it can open up new insights into a play you thought you knew well. Most important, I hope you'll read, or reread, Village Wooing, and watch a performance if you can. I haven't discussed the ideas about life and love in Village Wooing for a very good reason. It's a superb play, and you need to hear those ideas from the characters Shaw created. And that's it for today. Thank you.